Thank you, thank you. It really is, man, to have you here. I'm and excited to be here. I'm really excited to be here. Um, looking forward to tonight. So far, it's been a lot of energy, it's a lot of fun. really cool stuff, great music. It's great to see. So yeah, I'm it's excited. been a lot of fun. You know, we talk about like this theme is uh, one night March Madness. I mean, you've actually, uh, you've participated. You know what March Madness is when you talk about like, college basketball, you know, and all that stuff. You know what's crazy? I didn't know this originally when we planned this, but tomorrow, I believe tomorrow and Sunday is Michigan-Michigan State game. Yeah. Do I got that right? Weekend. Big weekend. Okay, big so where are my Go Blue fans in the room right now? Okay. And then where are the Spartans fans in the room? You here as well? Okay. Okay. Where's the people that you could care less in the room? <laughs> you know they're those people too, man. Well, we're glad you're all here. So I got to know. So we know you're a college D1 athlete and all that stuff. I want to know, uh, and they want to know, I, I assume. Tell us the things that we should know about you that we don't know. Like, uh, are you married? Yeah. I am married. You're married. Uh, yep, my wife over here, Rachel. What's uh, up? Say what up, Rachel. Say hi, Rachel. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. So married. Uh, what's your favorite food? Favorite food? Uh, got to say steak, although Chick-fil-A is... Very close Very second. There. Chick Fil A is pretty good. Chick Fil A, that's that's God's favorite meat right there. Oh yeah, Chick Fil A. Uh, how about favorite movie? Movie. Honestly, I I'm I some I have a tendency. You can ask my wife to fall asleep during movies. <laughs> um, but however, the mar modern Marvel, the the whole series, it's it's really cool how they. I love Marvel, man. Bring all the movies together, and right now with WandaVision, my wife and I are watching that. Anybody it's, watching WandaVision out there? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I got like, I think I got like an episode or two to catch up with my wife too. Yeah. It's fun though. Okay, um, let me think of one more here. Do you have any kids? We don't. No, no kids. kids. No kids. We got two dogs. Two dogs. Um, what kind of dogs? Uh, golden Doodles. <laughs> we got Brody and Harper. I should have brought a picture or something of them, but we got the one. He was a little crazy dog, so we had to get the second. So they play together all day and yeah. Dog, get off me. Go play with your friend. Yeah, exactly. I'm actually excited. I didn't know if I was even going to get to be here tonight because my dog, aka a baby, an actual baby on the way coming. I, I had another baby for the same reason, only so that Zealand would bother, <laughs> like stop bothering me. That's the only yeah. reason, honestly. Yeah. Uh, but no, it's cool, man. Um, so I just think it's cool, you know, tonight, this whole theme, March Madness. I think it's an incredible opportunity truly to have you here because you can actually speak to this. I mean, you've had an opportunity that most people don't have in their entire life to travel the world, to play uh, on a team that is very well known around the world. And even you played in front of thousands of people. Like what's that like being in front of that many people? Yeah, the experience at Michigan State was, was pretty crazy. We got to travel the world and play basketball. Uh, we got to go to Italy, um, got to go to the Bahamas, Hawaii, just to play basketball. Um, and a, a lot of opportunities with that. Um, playing in front of thousands of people, not gonna lie, that's kind of scary, especially at first. Um, I got this thing called, called tremors, benign essential tremors. I don't know if anybody else has it, but whenever my heart rate gets above a resting pace or a resting beat, whatever, yeah. I start to shake a little bit in my hands and my head. So I'll be sitting there at the free throw line and you know, you're running up and down the court. So your heart rate is going and I'm just shaking a little bit, just like, <laughs> Lord, please help this to go in. So, it, so it's a little scary, but man, it was a lot of excitement and a lot, a lot of fun. Roughly how many people like in a stadium, how many, roughly how many people are packing in there to watch a game before obviously COVID and all that jazz? Um, the stadium we played in the Breslin center. Um, I think that's like 8,000 maybe. Okay. Um, the final four, that's, I mean, you take a whole football stadium, put a little bitty basketball court in the middle wow. and have people packed into that stadium. So probably 50,000 plus fans. That's nuts. So why'd you pick basketball in the first place? Like what drew you to that? Uh, my family, we farm. I'm, I grew up here in Emily city, I went to Emily city high school, born and raised. Um, and in the summer is farming season. So you focus, got to play a little bit of baseball, but not really take it serious. In the summer, you farm. In the winter, that's your time to, to play sports. And being six foot five, basketball came kind of natural to me. My dad played basketball, my brother played basketball. 
And so it's like yeah. that pressure, like I'm six, five, I should know how yeah. to dunk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I better be able to touch rim or <laughs> yeah. I go up to like, I, like I got a, uh, I got a cousin and he is like seven foot, seven foot one, something like that. And I'm like, bro, can you dunk? And he's like, why does everyone ask me that? I don't know. Cause you're seven foot tall. Like, I just feel like you should be able to like, so yeah, that makes sense playing basketball. But why, um, why MSU though? Like, was that always growing up like a childhood thing or why'd you choose Michigan state? Yeah, so I've since since I was real young, I always was a Michigan State fan. Um, it, it was always a, a, a top ten program in the nation. Um, so I always just I had a dream of playing at Michigan State. It wasn't even a goal of mine when I was younger. Um, just had a dream of playing there one day. Never thought it would actually happen. But um, also with my farming background, Michigan State has one of the best agricultural. Uh, programs in the nation. So I figured if I went to Michigan State, if I got cut from the team, at least I had an education out of it. So that's why I chose State. That's smart. That's a good idea. Yeah. So take me, I mean, I know maybe a lot of people listening right now, it may not be obviously Michigan State or it may not be basketball, but there's something that one day they're longing to do. And it could be on different levels. For you, break down your story, going from high school all the way then to getting to Michigan State like what was that journey like what was the steps what was kind of your hopes your dreams senior year all that kind of stuff launching out yeah so coming out of high school um people were always you know always putting pressure on you you know what's your plan where are you gonna go to college trade school what college you gonna go to you gonna start working whatever you're gonna do so coming out of high school um I, I really wanted to play basketball and and my goal was to get a Division One scholarship, or a Division Two even scholarship. Well, coming out of high school, I wasn't good enough. So I ended up walking on at Hope College. Um, thought, you know, if I, I go to Hope College, it's a Christian college, get a Christian education, I get to play some basketball. Um, I, I thought I'd be able to play at that level. So I decided after high school, I guess I'll go to Hope College. Um, I finally got to Hope College and I ended up getting cut from their varsity team. So here I am at a freshman in college, everything's new to me, and um, the coach cuts me. And he had his reasons he cut me. Um, at the time, of course, I thought it was the greatest thing ever. Um, I thought I didn't deserve to be cut, but obviously I did. Um, so talking to coach, I, I decided, you know what? I, I really thought I was better than that. So. I told him, you know, I'm going to trans schools don't want you to transfer colleges very much, but there's kind of a loophole with junior college and you save a little bit of money because it's way cheaper than a $35,000 private school. Yeah. So I transferred to junior college, uh, played a year there at the junior college, had a lot of fun, um, played quite a bit there. And then um, finally, Towards the end of the season, I started getting some looks from Division II colleges, got a couple offers from Division II. And like I said earlier, my, my goal was to get a four-year full-ride scholarship, get college paid for. And as soon as I was in the office with the coach and the coach says, here's your scholarship. All you got to do is sign the line and, and you can come here for free. As soon as he gave me that paper and told me that, I just accomplished my goal. Yeah, wow. And I kind of just sat there and, you know, I thought I was going to be so excited at that moment. Man, I got my, everything set. Now I just get to coast through college and, and be the best person on the team. Well, I'm a goal setter. I was like, okay, check that box, got that goal. Didn't sign that paper. I'm going to see how far I can get. Maybe if I can walk on to Michigan State, then I'll be happy. Then I'll then I'll really be something. Um, if I can get that goal, okay. It didn't satisfy me quite all the way. So I was like, you know what? Let's see if I can walk on to Michigan State. So Yeah, I want to talk about that in a second. Something uh, I remember we were talking earlier this week when you talk about being at Hope College and stuff. You're at a Christian college. You were telling me, I thought it was interesting, that you found very out very quickly that just because you're at a Christian college, that doesn't mean anything. Like your faith was almost tested there. You got anything you want to say about that? Just the, you kind of realize college is college almost? Yeah. Um, I realize like as soon as you go away from mom and dad, it, you got to make decisions for yourself. And 
Once I stepped onto a Christian university, a Christian campus, my parents weren't there to make the decisions for me. No matter if it was a Christian college, a public college, or, or work, um, at some point I had to grow up and it, it didn't have to be at a Christian college. Um, all colleges have temptations. All life, you will always have temptations. And that's something I didn't realize until that's I was good. I was there. That's good. So let's talk about this this concept here because like when I, when I heard about you, it was like Matt Van Dyke walked on at Michigan State University. You were at Michigan State from 2014 to 2017. Walk me kind of through the process of what it was like to to be a walk on. Like, what does that mean that at a, a basketball team like Michigan State you walked on? What does that mean? So, in Division One and Division Two um, athletics, there there's kind of two tiers of players. There's the scholarship players. Um, each team has like in basketball, I think they got twelve scholarships. So these are the players that Coach Izzo would go to their high school games since their freshman year of high school. Um, he'd go to their house and have dinner with their parents at their house. He would pursue them and keep, keep pursuing them and tell them, hey, you want to come to Michigan State? I will give you playing time. I will, I'll take care of you. Um, but so that, that's the top tier. And then the second tier, then there's walk-ons. And, and that's, that's what, that was my dream at the time. That was my goal. And, and the walk-ons, um, we used to call them, we'd be the practice punching bags. Like, you know how sometimes in football you got the, the, the pillow that you hit or whatever, it's not a real person? That's what we were as walk-ons. Um, and and that was, that's what I wanted to be. Um, so uh, a walk-on, you had to prove yourself every day. You had to go and the coach didn't come to get you. You go and you have to show the coach why he needs, why you will make the team better. And so with being a walk-on, it's, it's a lot more unknown of if you'll make the team or if the coach even wants you. So what's the, what's the process? Like you worked on a farm. So what did you do? Like you went, to, you worked on the farm, you showed up yeah. at, what did you do? Yeah, so in the summer after junior college, um, when I decided I want to go to state, uh, at Michigan State, they had like practices and open gyms, and, and I caught wind and found out when practices were. Um, and so I would farm in the morning, start get get my stuff done, you know, start nice and early, probably five six o'clock, and then um, jump in the car at eight a.m. Get to East Lansing. It's about an hour and a half drive. Get there for a, a ten o'clock practice or a, a ten o'clock open gym um, or a 10 o'clock workout. And so by the time that workout started, I was already kind of tired from working in the morning and then the long drive, jump out of my car and try to play against these seven foot, 250 pound guys dunking all over me. I was kind of in over my head at first, but um, I just kept that pattern of just about twice a week, I would drive over to East Lansing after work just because I wanted to show the coaches I want this position. And not yeah. just because it's Michigan State. I yeah. want to earn it. You want them to see your face, know you were there. I remember when we were talking earlier this week, too, you told me that you were considered like the weird, like the walk-on was like the weird kid that yeah. no one wanted there. Um, it was almost like everyone thought you weren't capable, mm -hmm. that you really shouldn't be there. So you're doing all that, though. You're like, you're beating yourself up. You're like giving everything you got. And then what did they tell you? They told you because you're transferring all that. What did they have to say about that journey for you? Yeah, so I was going back and forth all summer. And then I got a, a call from one of the assistant coaches. And he said, hey, Matt, um, I'm sorry to tell you, but because of your academics switching colleges, you're not even eligible to be on our team. So I remember I was, I was at the farm um, working with my dad. And when I answered the call and it just broke me. And I, I, I remember I was in tears. My dad pulled me aside. We sat in his truck. And um, at that point in the conversation with the coach, he, he kind of gave me a sliver of hope of saying, hey, the next year you might be able to make the team, but absolutely no guarantees. So I kind of clung on to that because I thought if I was on the team, I would finally be happy and fulfilled. And since there was that sliver of hope, 
that was my target. That was my goal. So I put everything into getting that goal so I could be satisfied and happy through yeah. basketball. You're just going practice after practice. You're showing up. Finally, you're at a practice and a dude gets hurt. And it's like, here's maybe like my window of hope. What happens there? Yeah, so did that thing all summer. Finally, the school year started and practices started, official practices, and I wasn't allowed to practice. So I thought um, somebody got hurt or something. We needed one more player. And I'm sitting there, sitting there on the sideline, just like this, watching practice, just wishing I was playing, wishing I was playing. And they need another person. So they look to the side and I'm there every practice. They knew I was coming. They thought I was wasting my time because they knew I wasn't good enough. Um, and a coach looks over and says, hey, you, throws me a practice jersey. Hey, get in this drill. And, and, and kind of from that point on, I just kept coming to practice. I didn't have a, a locker before that. I didn't have a jersey. But I still, for months, weeks, just kept coming to practice, kept coming, just hoping, hoping that, man, finally, hopefully I'll make, hopefully I'll get on that team and, and be satisfied. So... You finally get to kind of be thrown in. Somebody's hurt. It gets your shot. How did you know whether or not you made the team? Like, at what point did you even figure out if you were on the team or not? So I was never told – I was never officially told I was on the team. Um, we had a thing called Midnight Madness where it's kind of like this. Like it's real hype, you know. They got the lights going, music, to announce the team. Um, the night before that, I looked on the team roster on the website – and saw that my name was on the roster. So nobody actually told me I was on the team. <laughs> I just saw I was on the roster. So I was like, well, I guess I'm going tomorrow and getting announced. <laughs> so, What was it like? You see your name on that roster. What did that feel like? You know, it felt good. It felt, it felt good. You know, I put in all that work, all that sacrifice. Um, we all have goals. We put sacrifice in. And when you re achieve those goals, it, it's a good feeling. Not yeah. going to lie. It felt great. That's true. I remember you were telling me it got to a point where the assistant coaches, they, were, they really liked you. They were pulling for you to make the team. You know, you said they're throwing you a jersey or shoes or whatever it was, like getting you in drills, and you could kind of feel that. But Coach Izzo was maybe a little bit different story. So I want to talk about this. Like, if you don't know Coach Izzo, he is a Hall of Fame head coach. I mean, you're talking the dude makes over $4 million a year to coach the Michigan State Spartans. I mean, like, he's, he's like big time in the basketball world you know, of college basketball. So talk to me a little bit about just, you know, what was it like playing for him? Like, what did he think of you? Because you said all the assistant coaches, you know, when I talked to you before that they were pulling for you. What did Coach Izzo think of you? Yeah, so Coach Izzo, great Hall of Fame coach. Um, if, you, if you know him, you know what I'm talking about. But his job, what he gets paid over $4 million for is to win basketball games. He doesn't get paid to worry about the walk-ons like me. So for the first two years that I was on the team, he wouldn't even call me by name. Um, he would just say, hey, you, number 30, or hey, you. He, he would just say stuff like that. He, he didn't even know me by name. And, and all the assistant coaches, those were the guys that I was closer to because they're with the team more. Um, those were the guys that were fighting for me and actually kind of going back and coach with us. So they were saying, hey, hey, coach, we could use this kid. And Izzo was saying, no, he's, he's not even good at basketball. We don't need him. And so coach kind of, I felt like had it out for me. And I kind of had a chip on my shoulder at the time for that, for the first couple of years. Yeah. I, I think like, I think that can be real. I think there's times where we, we can kind of like wear our emotions on our sleeve or we know someone doesn't like us. So it's kind of like, well, forget you then, you know, I'm going to do my thing. But here, here's what, honestly, like I've, I've known enough of your life before I ever got to meet you, whether it's like seeing it on YouTube or whatever it was. I remember, I remember like when this kid from Emily City, we all found it, he, he was playing for the Michigan State Spartans. I remember finding out about that. And the thing I've watched with you is that one, there's one thing actually greater than your basketball skills that I've seen with you is your character, honestly. And I look at, um, I look at like Coach Izzo, like he didn't like you and stuff. And you said you were kind of like wearing that but you never threw it back in his face. Like you always continued to give your best. You always continue to show like who you truly are. And how many of y'all, you ever felt that before? Like if somebody doesn't like you, you're like, well, I'm going to write you off, forget you anyways. Rather than truly continuing to say, you know what? No, who I am is not based upon what you think of me. Who I am is who I am. And so if truly you know who you are, 
then you're going to let your character shine through who you are, not what someone else thinks who you, who you are. And I think for me, man, that's the thing that really speaks to me about you because here's Coach Izzo. He's never, I'm about to show you a clip. He's never seen this before, okay? And here's, here's what I think is crazy is you know Coach Izzo doesn't like you. Didn't even say your name until your senior year. But this, after you showed your character, not just your skills, but your character, this is what Coach, Coach Izzo had to say about him. Check it out. This is your first time. You need to watch it. He came in as a walk-on one summer. He was here all summer long, and my assistants kept saying, hey, we got this guy that's been working out with our guys. Our guys love him. And that's kind of the first endorsement of Matt Van Dyke was our players. What a better, what a better endorsement than from his peers. And ever since then, you know, he's been a phenomenal athlete, but a kind of a blue-collar kid, you know. Worked on a farm, did his work came here and worked, great student, and he's grown as a player, you know, into an integral part of our team. He might only play 10, 12 minutes a, a game, but those minutes are very important, and he really helped hold the fort down with all the injuries we've had to our bigs. It's been interesting to see him go from walk-on to a starter, definitely a player that I think our players respect and I know our coaches do. That's cool. That's the first time you ever saw that. I thought that was amazing watching that. And uh, I've been like, have you ever seen like the clip of what Coach Izzo had to say about you? He goes, never. I go, okay, well, you're going to see it for the first time on one night then. I just think it's such a testimony of your character because, um, man, being on a team like that, it was, it was hard. Like, you know, it was really hard work, you know, hearing you tell me the story of it. Because um, you had an interesting conversation with Coach Izzo because the schedule was nuts being on the team. Like you would have three to four either workouts or practices or team meetings a day. T tell them about that, that one time when uh, you did not have practice and so you were excited to meet your family. Yeah, our schedule was crazy. Just practices, training table, uh, film sessions, all kinds of stuff. So one, one night after, after practice, I talked to one of the assistant coaches. I'm like, hey, I haven't seen – I live like an hour and a half from the stadium where we practice. And I told the coach, hey, I haven't seen my parents, my family in a long time. They're all in town. Can I head home, meet them at Wendy's right here off the freeway, meet them at Wendy's, have a meal with them, then come back that night? They're like, yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So I'm driving home, and I've got – so the schedule was so grueling. We would, like, be sitting there 8 o'clock at night, and they'd text us, hey, meeting in 20 minutes. So no matter where you're at, you got to be at the stadium in 20 minutes sitting there for a meeting. And so this happened all the time. So I'm driving home. I already told the assistant coaches. They said, hey, there's no meeting tonight. You're good. So I'm driving home. Finally get to Emily City, pull over. I'm in Wendy's with my family, just sat down. I get the text. Meeting, 20 minutes. So I call the assistant coaches, and I'm like, hey, I'm out of town. Um... And they're like, sorry, you got to get back. So, yeah, that was just. You had to leave your whole family just sitting there. Leave my whole family. Maybe oh. I stayed for two more minutes and told them I got stuck in traffic or something. But Because you had to eat your Frosty. Yeah, That's I had why. to. <laughs> pass that up. So when did you do homework? Because you're not, you're not in the NBA. You're in college. So you have all this homework you have to do still. Yeah, you, you find time to do the homework. Um, whether it's on the on the plane or on the bus, uh, sometimes in the hotel room bef before a game or between practices, they got a little room for you to do your homework in the stadium. But you wake up, go to the stadium, go to class, go to the stadium. You're in there from sunrise till sundown. Uh, you don't have a social life. It's just sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. So. Wow. Yeah. So what's this conversation? You have this crazy schedule. And coach already, like, you're not his, like, favorite dude, right? And, like, you're earning his respect. But what's this conversation that you have with Coach Izzo? Uh, one thing that really – so my whole life, we would work hard six days a week. But on Sunday, you know, that's the day that the family comes together. We go to church. We relax. And, and we focus. And um, we didn't have that at Michigan State. We were seven, seven days a week, go, go, go. And um, it, it kind of, it, it was irritating and, and just rubbed me real wrong. And so I had a conversation with coach, even though I wasn't the star player, I wasn't, I was a walk on. I said, hey coach, you know, I, I'd really appreciate if we could have some time Sunday morning so we could go to church. And, and su surprising to me, he said, you know, I think that's a good idea. Wow. I think 
I think you guys should be able to go to church. So I think that's just, that is crazy. Like to ask your coach like that, knowing like you're already a walk on and risking it. And that's what I'm talking about character. Like he's risking possibly this opportunity for his coach to like, <laughs> to not like you even more because you're trying to put God first. You know what I mean? I think that really is crazy. So you make the team walk me through this, this MSU journey. Like the first year was even crazy in itself. Like the team went pretty far and, you know, in March Madness and all that. Walk me through a little bit of what that journey being at MSU on that team looked like. Yeah, it was, it was definitely something out of this world. Um, first year we went to the final four. Um, I mean, you, you come into, it was in Indianapolis, you go there, the whole city shut down. There's billboards of your teammates, uh, at the airport, you're greeted by police officers who escort you and, uh, was it a Formula One race car that escorts you to the hotel? Gonna get um, you there a little quicker. Yeah, we, we're, we're moving. <laughs> um, it, we had a number of championships. Um, yeah, it was, it was a lot of excitement. We traveled the world. Um, yeah. You know, I think, uh, I think about just like that first year, what Coach Izzo even had to say about you. And I, this is the picture I think is crazy to paint is you were a walk-on. But in that video, you know, Coach Izzo said, from being a walk-on to a starter. And when you're at a Big Ten school, he said, that's a story in itself. So you were able to start in some games? Yeah, I, I, I came a long way while I was there. I, the, the assistant coaches were great and, and worked with me a lot and helped develop me. But I came in as a walk-on. The coach didn't want me. And then eventually I was able to make the team. And I thought, man, once I make the team, I'll be so happy. And then I finally made the team, and it was cool and all, but I was like, okay, now I want to I play. So then I finally got into a game. Um, and it was like at the end of the game when we were up by like 30 or something. And then I was like, all right, now I want to get in a game when it's actual real, real live action. And, and then I did. And then I was like, all right, now I want to play more. And I ended up going from – dreaming to walk on this team to being a starter for five games. Um, and, and we went 5-0 and in those games. and Perfect record, baby. Yeah. 5-0, five, five games starting. <laughs> yeah. But even with starting, I, I didn't start six games. You know, I was always, always on to the next excitement, always looking for that next thing. But Yeah. Well, he's talking about excitement. I saw a clip I want to show them. And I know, like, hey, this, you like this clip. It's a cool clip. Yeah. And can you set, can you set it up? Now, Sports Center. This was in Sports Center's top ten. Okay, and you're playing Ohio State University. Can you set up this moment that's happening? Yeah. So this is this is a game where I was in. A, we call them scrub minutes. It's when you're up by twenty or down by twenty. That, that's when the walk-ons go in. Um, and I hadn't played that much. And we're in the game. And of course, I go in there and I'm going full force. I'm trying to. <laughs> wreak havoc or whatever dude i was on the second string in seventh grade we were called the kamikaze squad because when we went in there we were just going for it yeah so so we're playing and and we tip the ball i tip it ahead to elvin ellis he, he's dribbling down the court he looks back at me he's the gutsiest guy i i know he's looking back at me and and i was i was i had the highest one of the years i had the highest vertical on the team wow um, and he, he knew that cause we played a lot together and we played pretty well together, but he looks back at me. I look at him and I say, throw it off the backboard. So he's dribbling down and, and he does, he throws it off the backboard. Next thing I remember, I like blanked out. <laughs> Next thing I remember is I'm running back on defense thinking what just happened? <laughs> Check it out. Sports center top 10. You do stuff. Here is oh, Ellis. What's just done? Oh, he left it for Van Tell Dyke. Him. Best jumper on the team is Van Dyke. Matt Van Dyke, the red shirt junior, with the dunk. Man, I wish I could dunk. I wish I could dunk so bad. Ah, oh, man. There's people that are 5'9", they can dunk. Yeah. Exactly. I'm not one of them. Like, I, I'm not. It had been a rush, though, bro. Like, making that play, starting those games, you're being, like, being on a team, you know, like like MSU being a Spartan. You talked about like entire towns would shut down, the police escorting you. I know before you told me like people were crazy, like huge parties would be thrown for you. Like you were treated like 
royalty. And I asked you this, him, this question backstage and I'll, I'll kind of like share it for him. But I just said like, what was it like, like with girls? Like were girls into you because you were like a Spartan? And, and th- like, this is the truth. They didn't know your name. They didn't know anything about you. They just knew that he was on the basketball team and tons of girls were into him just because of that. And that's not like a bragging thing. That just goes to show you like literally just because you had, he's like saying sorry to his wife in the front row. (laughs) Like, it's so good. Hey, they wanted the boy. You got to end up with the man. That's what we're saying. Okay. So my, my dad, my dad always taught me that. Okay. So, um, you know, but you're getting all this, uh, this attention for girls and the way you used to explain it to me is like, it was like you, you had it all. Like you're on, on top of the world. Like what was that feeling? Like you're on top of the world. Yeah, like I had all these goals and I just kept setting my goals higher and higher and higher. And from the outside in, it looked like I was on top of the world. Um, if you if you look, you know, I made top 10 sports center. I started, I did all these things. On the outside, it, it really looked like I was on top of the world. Um, and, and now I often, I often look back at my time at Michigan State and I think back to before it, before these jerseys, before the highlights, before the, I feel weird saying it, but celebrity status from a small town kid from Emily City that kind of was like a celebrity status for me. But before all of that, um, I, I remember sitting at practice, one, one of the practices before I was on the team and looking at one of the guys on the team, just probably the worst guy on the team and just thinking, Man, if I was that guy right there, he was right in front of me. And I was saying, if I was that guy right there, I would be like satisfied. I would be happy. All, all my work over the past, well, I was 21, over the past 21 years just hits that moment and I'm satisfied and happy. And I think, I think we have that a lot. Have any of you guys ever had that? Have you guys ever yep. been searching through Instagram and seen somebody who's got 20,000 followers and is posting, they're on this vacation this week, this vacation the next week? Um, you ever think, man, that kid, he dresses cool. I wish I had, had the money to afford those clothes. Yep. Or, hey, I wish I had more friends. I, I would really be happy if I had more friends. Yep. Um, wow. and, and, and I felt that when I was at Michigan State, um, I remember looking back and thinking, man, if only I was that kid that was on the team, I'd be happy. Once I got on the team, I was looking for the next thing. Man, if only I could play, I'd be happy. Okay, I played, check mark, next thing. If only I could start, I would be happy. Okay, I started, next thing. If only I had some more notoriety. I was on SportsCenter. People I'd never heard of start following me on Instagram. I was on to the next thing. I was always running on this treadmill, always looking for the next thing, thinking that next thing would satisfy me and I'd have that moment of relaxation of, ah, I'm happy, I'm satisfied now. Um, And in the Bible, it talks about um, what is it for a man to sacrifice the whole world, to gain the whole world and sacrifice his soul. Yeah. And and that's kind of, at, at times, that's what I felt like. I felt like sometimes at Michigan State, I was, I was, things were great, but at, at times I was miserable. Um, at, at times I was, I was searching for that, that next thing, that next exciting thing. And um, I re- realized that whether I made the team, now looking back, whether I made the team or didn't make the team, whether you have, 20 followers or 20,000 followers, whether you got cool clothes, boring clothes, I mean, fashion changes, no matter what, I am a child of God. I, I am Matt Van Dyke. It, one thing I wish I could go back and tell myself is, um, I, I'm a child of God, and the, the Bible talks about God as being a potter, and, and we are clay, and, and God is sitting there. You ever see somebody doing a clay pottery thing? They got their foot on the paddle, and, and they're messing with the clay, and, and, and the potter's digging his hand in here, putting water on here, pushing here, and he's constantly moving and molding, 
And, and that's kind of what, what life is like and, and the things I went through and I continue to go through. These jerseys are not who I am. If these burn in a fire, oh well. Oh well, you can make another, you can buy another. These things are temporary. Life is temporary. Those, those highs of all this stuff don't define me. The, the lows, those don't define me either. God is building, he's making a piece of pottery, a, a beautiful vase. And he's going to push a little bit here, pull a little bit here. And he's constantly using all these events to form me into this beautiful creation and, and this perfect human being. God, this God that's doing this, he created everything. He created this building. He created earth. He created Mars. And we finally just got to Mars. And he created that way back in the day. He created Mars, but he also created you. He created you. He created me. And he created me in his own image. He didn't just make me turn his back on me and walk away. This whole time through this whole process, God had me in his, in his hand. He was constantly forming me. He would put me in situations to make me into a better person, to give me opportunities like this, to talk to you guys. This is what I love. This stuff was fun. Don't get me wrong. Great memories. But this is what it's about. I, I don't want to be a basketball, famous basketball player. I, I just want to be an influence, influencer of Jesus and, and just tell you guys about the love that Jesus has for you. And, and, and you might be going through a time of, of just triumph. Just you feel on top of this world. Or you might be going through a time where maybe somebody just died. Or, or, or maybe you didn't get a good report card or maybe you just lost your job maybe you wish you had a better job opportunity god uses all these circumstances and he's molding you into this beautiful creation and he's got you in his hand and he really really does love you and care for you like unimaginably amounts so um that's what i want to leave you with this stuff's cool and all it's fun but this isn't who i am and, and what you're going through good or bad that's not what, who you are either. You are a child of Christ. You are created in his own image, and he loves you. Amen. Y'all appreciate Matt here tonight. We show him some love. That's awesome, man. Hey, get up on your feet wherever you are. Get up on your feet. Stay up here with me, bro. Stay up here. You know what? What Matt's sharing about, it's interesting because when we were, we were meeting, we were talking about everything he was going to share about tonight, I had this whole idea in my mind of what he could possibly share based upon like, man, he got to play at Michigan State, what he's going to share. And he said something to me that it just, it honestly kind of messed my whole thinking up. It, it shook me. And we had to kind of like pray about it, reformulate all this tonight. He said, you know what, to be honest, in a lot of ways at Michigan State, I was miserable. And I was like, wait, wait, what? <laughs> that is not what I was thinking you were going to say. Like, I thought you were going to say, like, it was the highlight of my life. And all. He goes, no, I was miserable. He said, because I got in this rat race of just thinking if I could just achieve the next thing, then I'd be fulfilled. You guys heard him. You're thinking, man, if I could just be dating that person, I'd be fulfilled. If I was just born into that family, I'd, it'd be better. My life wouldn't be so crappy. Like, whatever it is that's passing through your mind, you're in this rat race like he's talking about. You're just thinking, if, then. And he said, I was miserable. And I was like, whoa, bro, I am like shook right now. What are you? And when he broke that down for me, it, it made such sense to me. He said, you know what? There is only one thing that has ever fulfilled me in my entire life, and it's Jesus Christ. It's not playing for the Spartans. It's not anything I've ever done. It is who I am. And, and I think, man, that message is who you are. And if you're going to burn these jerseys, by the way, I want one. Don't burn them. Don't burn them. I want them. I won't burn them. But I love that thought process of saying, you know what? This is all just stuff. That was just a school and an opportunity. And did you learn a lot from it? Oh, yeah, for sure. But ultimately, you need to realize tonight that you are in the potter's hands. And whatever you're facing, good, bad, ugly, whatever it is, You've been creating the image of God, therefore God has not just plopped you on planet Earth to hopefully make it. You are in his hands. But listen, you have to allow him 
to sculpt you and shape you. So when we hit the highs, we go, oh, this is God sculpting me and shaping me. This is good. But the issue is, it's sometimes, most of the time, the lows that he's actually forming you to be the person that he's always created you to be. And tonight, I just have a very simple question. And just in respect to this moment, if you just bow your heads and close your eyes with me for a second, I'm going to have Matt pray here in a moment. I'm going to lead you in one prayer, and I want Matt to just pray over your life here. But if you're here tonight, and maybe you found yourself stuck in that rat race, you've just been thinking, man, if I could just, if I could just be this or get this or achieve this or whatever it is, maybe you're just thinking I'd be more fulfilled. But I just think his story tonight is such a real story to have us all check our hearts with God tonight to recognize that what we have or what we get to do or any of these things will not be what fulfill us. But tonight, I need you to understand this. Only a relationship with Jesus Christ will ever fulfill you in life. It's the only thing. It, was, it will be the only thing I promise you ever. I've experienced such highs and lows. I have experienced it just like any person. And I have come to found that only Jesus. So if you're in this room tonight, if you're any of our family, VIP, anybody online, and you're saying, that's me, I got to be the person to admit that I do not have a relationship with Jesus. And I've been running. I love how, you, how he said it. It's like I've been running, but I'm on a treadmill. I'm running, but I'm not going anywhere. And you're saying tonight, you want to make it your opportunity. You want to remember this date, March 3rd, 2021, the year that you stopped going nowhere, the year that you stopped trying to be fulfilled by things that will always leave you empty. And you can remember this night, not by having some free Chick-fil-A, not by even Matt Van Dyke speaking, but the night that Jesus Christ came into your heart and your soul and changed you forever. And if that's you and you're saying, I want that tonight, I want what Matt's been talking about. I'm sick of just running and trying to achieve thing after thing and, and be thing after thing when I already am the person I'm supposed to be, a child of the living God created in his image. And now what you have to do is just give him yourself. When you give him all of you, guess what you get in return? All of him. So if that's you, just by heads bowed, eyes closed, by the lifting of your hand, would you lift your hand with me right now just to acknowledge that that's what you want? You want Jesus? I see hands up all over the place, to the front, the back, both sides. I see y'all back there. Just keep it up for one sec. And I'm just looking out because I want to be able to pray for you after this whole night's over with. I may not know your name, but I'm trying to take in your face right now, and I'm trying to take in your heart in this moment. And our team's going to be praying for you. There's going to be people remembering you. You can put it down. Thank you. But can I just tell you that most importantly, it doesn't matter if I see your hand because God saw you. He sees you tonight. He knows exactly what you're thinking, what you're going through, everything you desire, every struggle. He knows you real well because he created you. And I'm just going to lead you in a prayer of salvation. And I'm going to have Matt just pray a prayer to just to bless you in this moment. From everything that he's gone through and learned, I just think he has something to just to give you here tonight. But if you just raise your hand, maybe there's even some here that you still want to raise it or you want to join this moment. But if you just raise your hand, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. It's called just a prayer of salvation. It's acknowledging that you need saving, meaning I've sinned. I've fallen short of who Jesus is. It's recognizing that he died on the cross for your sin and he rose from the tomb to give you life. There's a lot of people in this room, you're breathing, but you're not fully alive. You're just a dead man walking. You're running, but you're not moving. And I wanna tell you tonight, God wants to set your feet free so when you run, you will run a distance in life and you will even not grow weary. God wants to set your heart free so you don't have to keep striving for the things you've been striving for. You think that relationship's going to fulfill you? I promise you, one day you're going to wake up and realize it doesn't. 
You think that if you just became some big shot, if you had a lot of followers, that's going to fulfill you? I promise you, one day you will wake up and realize that you are empty only because of one reason, because you don't have Jesus. So tonight, look up at me really quick now. We're going to pray a prayer. And when we pray this prayer, the Bible says a couple things. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, number one, you need to know that you are saved, the Bible says. Meaning, where you were once bound for hell, that's an actual place, it's real, your own destruction. One day when, you, when your body, you think it just goes in the ground, it ain't just in the ground, your soul goes somewhere as well. So when we pray this prayer, your soul no longer goes to hell, but the Bible says that you are now have a one-way ticket to heaven. And number two, you have to understand that the Bible says all the angels in heaven rejoice over you giving your life to Jesus tonight. And where you thought you were living your life, starting walking in this night for one thing, you get to walk out of here and you get to live a brand new life in Jesus because the Bible says that you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. So no matter what you've done, it's about to be erased and forgiven and done. We're going to leave it right here. The Bible says we're going to throw it into the sea of forgetfulness, meaning we're done with it. We ain't going back to it. You don't have to be that person anymore. So by your heads, close your eyes. Here we go. We just close our eyes so we can focus. That's all it is. So that you don't have to see any people around you or maybe a good looking girl next to you. You can stop thinking about whatever it is. We're just going to focus for a second here, okay? And when I pray, what you're going to do is repeat after me. And so this isn't like a manufactured, like printed out prayer. I'm just going to make it up on the spot because you don't have to talk to God in any certain way. You can just talk to God. It can just be from your heart. So as I pray it and you pray with me, so you're going to repeat after me across this whole place, we are going to start seeing hearts and souls step from death to life. We're going to start seeing people step from place of defeat to victory tonight. We're going to see people in addictions step out of addictions. We're going to see strongholds broken when we pray this prayer. You ready? So say it with me. Say, Jesus, I call out your name tonight because I need forgiveness. I'm broken and I'm in need of a savior. I've been walking around defeated. I've been walking around dead and I just want to be alive. I've been running, but I'm not going anywhere. And so tonight, Jesus, I want to remember this night. I want to remember this moment for the rest of my life. When you forgave me, when you raised me up from death, and when you gave me life. So Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I thank you for raising from the dead. So when I pray this prayer tonight, I could walk in freedom, I could walk in victory, and I could walk as a child of the living God. I give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody says amen tonight. Give him a shout of praise. Give him a shout of praise. Hey, thanks for checking us out. You can see any latest sermons here, or you can go to weareoneyouth.com, scroll to the very bottom, and there's a connect bar. And on that connect bar, I want you to just let us know how this sermon has impacted you. If you've made a personal decision for Jesus Christ, we wanna know about it. We'd love to know your testimony. We'd love to know who you are and to really connect and be a part of the family with you. So if you can do that, we would love for that to happen. Or if you have any questions about upcoming events or more about who we are, browse our website. You can check that out there as well. If you liked what you heard today and you'd like to come on out as a part of our gathering on Wednesday nights, we encourage you to do that. We'd love to shake your hand. We'd love to hug you and welcome you to the family. Or you can check us out on social media and be a part of what's going on every day here at We Are One. God bless.